two mass shootings in the United States have jolted the nation. In Kansas City, three suspects were detained after authorities say shots were fired near the Chiefs' Super Bowl parade, terrorizing the crowd, and police have now just made two arrests, injuring at least 21 people in the shooting, many of them children, and killing one person. In the Bronx, gang violence erupted in the subway, leaving one person dead and five injured. Congressman Richie Torres has emerged as a leading Democrat in the House of Representatives. His district includes where the subway shooting occurred, and he joins me now on set. Congressman, thanks for joining us. You recently have raised uh, the, the policy issue of the Iron Pipeline and, and talk, working with the Justice Department in order to stop gun violence. Explain to folks what is the Iron Pipeline and what specifically should folks be doing in order to prevent the shootings from happening? So the majority of guns recovered in New York State are, 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 are from the South and are flowing to states like New York through the Iron Pipeline. Uh, and so even though New York State and New York City have the strictest gun laws in the country, right, as you know, guns can easily cross state lines. You can easily purchase a gun in the South and then bring it to a state like New York, and it's mostly flowing through the Iron Pipeline. And so more efforts have to be made to crack down on the illicit flow of guns. And ultimately, there is no substitute for federal legislation. Um, Congress has to enact gun safety legislation. Uh, you know, for me, the epidemic of gun violence in America is not an inevitability, it's a policy choice. And we have chosen as a society to allow these instruments of mass murder to flow freely uh, in the hands of dangerous people. All right, switching gears now. The Senate just passes bipartisan uh, legislation for aid for Taiwan, Israel, and Ukraine. What's going to happen with it in the House of Representatives? Some have raised the prospects of there being a, a discharge petition in order to get it done. What do you see as a path forward? Look, uh, I mean, Speaker Johnson should bring it to the floor for a vote. Uh, but if he's intransigent in his opposition to aid to Ukraine, then the only path is a discharge petition. But it's going to be an uphill battle, right? You know, if the bill were to be brought to the floor for a vote, the majority of Democrats and a significant subset of Republicans would vote for it. But not every Republican who would vote for a bill on the floor is going to sign a discharge, and therein lies the challenge. And of course, Democrats who oppose aid to Israel are unlikely to sign a discharge that would bring the bill to the floor for so a vote. So what's the path forward? I mean, our allies need the I mean— we, we are at a standstill. and. We as a country, we don't, we're the leader of the free world. We are undermining our own reputation, not only as the leader of the free world, but as a reliable partner of allies like Ukraine, Israel, and Taiwan. And we're sending a message that emboldens our enemies like Russia and the Chinese Communist Party. So, so meanwhile, you've emerged as one of the key Democrats, key pragmatic progressives. Right? I mean, how would you characterize your political belief system right now in terms of where you stand in the Democratic Party before Trad you? Traditional liberal Democrat. And so when you look, though, at where Democrats are holistically on the issue of Israel, they're divided. So how do you think that's impacted President Biden's reelection efforts? And why has Israel become such a, 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 an important issue for you uh, and your political beliefs? Well, we have to be careful not to mistake a visible vocal minority for majority. Um, President Biden, who's the leader of the Democratic Party, is unequivocally pro-Israel. Hakeem Jeffries, who's the leader of House Democrats, is unequivocally pro-Israel. And the overwhelming majority of Democrats are pro-Israel and would support aid to Israel in the context of a comprehensive security supplemental. Uh, and so, you know, the opposition still remains the fringe of congressional Democrats. But they've been following you everywhere. They were in your office this week. Susan Sarandon was there. You were in a Twitter feud with Susan yeah. Sarandon. What's going on with the Sarandon thing? Look, I come from the Bronx, so I, I've had to face far more fearsome opponents than Susan Sarandon. Um, but. You know, no amount of bullying or intimidation or harassment is going to change my fundamental beliefs about the U.S.-Israel relationship. So specifically, then, what's the path forward? Because you look at a state like Michigan, where Biden's down 10 percentage points uh, to Trump. Obviously, uh, the, the vote in Michigan and progressives in Michigan are very disappointed in what Biden's doing. What should he be doing in order to turn this around heading into 2024? Look, the president has to do what's right. Uh, and the right thing to do is, is to support our greatest ally in the Middle East, Israel. But keep in mind, in political terms, the election is a lifetime away. Uh, and ultimately, the American people are going to see Donald Trump for who he is, an existential threat to our democracy. And President Biden has had the most productive and productively bipartisan presidency in recent history on issues like gun safety, infrastructure, clean energy. 
I think he's he's earned his right to be reelected. You've spoken out a lot about anti-Semitism yeah. and what's been happening across the country. It's startling to see just how many acts of anti-Semitism yeah. have just been so blatant in the United States. Why why was that important for you? You gave an, an incredibly moving speech uh, at a synagogue talking about uh, stopping anti-Semitism. Where does that passion for this issue come from? Look, it, it, it comes from a basic belief that we all have a moral obligation to speak out against hate, no matter what form it takes, no matter what direction from which it comes. You know, as a student of history, it's not lost on me that there were Jewish Americans who gave their lives for the cause of civil rights, right? Michael Schwarn and Andrew Goodman were murdered in the Mississippi burning so that people of color could have the right to vote unencumbered by the terror and violence of Jim Crow. And so for me, the lesson of history is that we're all in this together. We're all morally interconnected. What should Democrats learn from the special election this week, Swazi winning? What can they learn? Well, uh, I think we have the momentum. Uh, you know, in 2022, the cruel irony of the 2022 election cycle is that there was a red wave almost nowhere except New York, and ground zero for the red wave was Long Island. And the district that we lost by the largest margin was uh, New York 3. The fact that Tom Suozzi won it back by an even larger margin, I think, is an overwhelming show of force and momentum for the Democratic Party. And, and candidate quality matters. And Tom Suozzi was a compelling candidate. You know, I've been really struck by this in covering Washington for the last decade and, and, and interviewing lawmakers. I've noticed a shift in terms of the culture, uh, specifically amongst Democrats, in being open to talking about mental health. Someone like Senator John Fetterman has been very open, even this week recently, yeah. uh, talking about uh, what he's been through at Walter Reed Medical Center and whatnot. You've also been very open about your own mental health journey and how it's impacted your policy uh, p position, specifically on the issue of housing. And so uh, t talk to me about that, because I think so much of politics right now doesn't feel personal to so many people. It feels very toxic, to be blunt. Uh, and a lot of folks don't identify with either party, to be candid. But you've really made the issue of housing and mental health uh, something that's talked about and not something that I've noticed in many other lawmakers. Look, even though we're making progress and the stigma around mental health shows signs of eroding, the number of members of Congress who speak openly about mental illness remains vanishingly small. Right? John Fetterman in the Senate, myself in the House. Look, I, I openly admit that I struggle with depression, and I've struggled with depression for most of my adult life. Uh, every morning I take an antidepressant, Wellbutrin XL, and I feel no shame in admitting it because it enables me to be the best version of myself. And I would not be alive today. I would not be a member of Congress were it not for mental health care and the stability that it gives me every day. You know, back in 2007 and 2008, I had dropped out of college because I found myself struggling with depression. I began abusing substances. There were moments when I thought of taking my own life because I felt as if the world around me had collapsed. And I, I even underwent hospitalization. Uh, and I never thought seven years later I would become the youngest elected official in America's largest city, and then seven years later become a member of the United States Congress. And so the lesson learned from my life is even in your moment of greatest darkness, never lose hope. We're gonna leave it there. Congressman Richie Torres, a Democrat from New York. Thank you so much for coming in to talk to us here at The Hill. Of course. Appreciate it. And for more and all the latest of political and policy news, just head to thehill.com.